Tonight I'm going to talk to you about uh, Eucharistic miracles, and one in particular in Santarém, in Portugal. In 1247, uh, the town of Santarém, Portugal, became the site of Eucharistic miracle that is most commonly referred to as the Most Holy Miracle, and that still remains in the same church where it has been kept for over 800 years. And I've got a couple of pictures of it that we'll pass around later during the table discussion time, so you can see what I'm talking about. The story begins with the misery of a woman who lived in Santarém, unhappy and despondent at her husband's ill treatment of her. Instead of seeking God for the help that she needed to deal with her unhappy relationship, she listened to a neighbor who advised her that when the woman went to receive communion, which at that time was given only on the tongue, not to swallow the host, that piece of bread, but hide it in her veil, and then later, in secret, give it to the neighbor, and she would bring about the change in the husband that the woman sought. Following the neighbor's instructions, she took the sacred host out of her mouth and hid it in her veil on the way home from church. At home, she hid the host in a wooden chest and then went to tell the neighbor she had done what she was told to do. However, God had other plans. As the woman was walking across the street, there were others nearby who noticed blood on the veil in which the woman had hidden the host on the way back from church. When told about the blood on her veil, she quickly went home and placed the veil also inside the wooden chest where she had hidden the sacred host and then locked the chest. That night, she and her husband were awakened by a brilliant light emanating from the chest as well as heavenly music. The husband, asking his wife why such a thing was happening, was told the story of how she had taken the host and hidden it in the chest. They knelt before the chest and it opened on its own. They went to tell their parish priest who then informed the neighborhood and the town. The host was placed in the chapel of St. Stephen's and encased in a wax ball for protection. Another miracle occurred when the ball of wax that encased the host was transformed into a crystal vial. The blood inside the vial maintains the same color and form of fresh blood, and in one part of the host at different times, there appear image of Christ, images of Christ in various scenes from his life. In this and other Eucharistic miracles that have occurred in other parts of the world, the scientific examination of the flesh and blood in the host reveals that it is made up of living tissue and blood. It is not from a corpse. It is AB positive and it is heart muscle. Jesus is literally giving us his sacred heart when we receive him in the Holy Eucharist. Every Eucharist is a miracle because of the consecration at Mass, the entire substance of bread and wine, is changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. But it is a miracle seen only with the eyes of faith. And so sometimes Jesus performs these other types of Eucharistic miracles where the appearance of bread and wine are removed so that we can see his actual flesh and blood. Our belief in the Eucharist isn't based on these miracles, but rather affirmed by them. In the Gospels, Jesus shows his wounds to the Apostle Thomas so that he would believe in his resurrection. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So remember that every time you attend Mass and every time you enter a chapel or a church containing the Eucharist, you are entering into the presence of a true miracle that radiates the love and mercy of God and his desire to be with you and in you for now and for all eternity. Okay. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Deacon Bill cannot be here tonight. So, I got the call before 3 o'clock. Can you please do the teaching tonight? So I have that much time to prepare. Anyway, I was brought up, I was
was always told, we were always told, that when somebody asks you to do something, especially if it is for God, then don't say no. Which brings back a story, not that I am after reward, but I don't want the fate of the second woman. Now let me tell you the story. Jesus and Peter went out to the remote place. Nighttime came and Jesus said, Peter, knock on the door of that big house. Peter said, but Lord, this is late at night. You know, we're bothering people. Just go and knock. So Peter knocked. And when he knocked, the woman came out to the door and almost closed the door on them. This is late. I have no room for you in spite of the big house. So Peter said, so now what? Jesus said, knock on the door of that small house. And Peter did. And the woman came out. My house is small. I have no spare room, but come on in anyway. And then she fixed them dinner. And she said, you can sleep in this corner of the house because I have no spare room. So made them comfortable. The next day, she cooked breakfast for them. And before they left, Jesus said, Thank you very much for your kindness. May you have plenty and abundance of whatever you do first today. So the woman was running late because she had to take care of them. So she sat at the weaving machine, the weaving loom, and started weaving. She was making up for lost time. And then a lot of beautiful, exquisite cloth came out and it, it wouldn't stop. And the next door neighbor, the one from the big house, came. Oh, how beautiful! Where did you ever get this beautiful material? And she told the story about the two strangers who spent the night. And she said, oh, I'm going home. If they come back, I let them in. Sure enough, Jesus and Peter came back. And she pulled them right in even before they can ask for a room to stay in. And when she pulled them in, she made them dinner, put them in the spare room, made them comfortable. The next day, she made breakfast for them. And then she was after that exquisite, beautiful material. And then, before they left, Jesus said, Thank you very much for your kindness. May you have an abundance of whatever you do first today. Determined that she was going to weave a lot and not to get up from where she was weaving, she went to the bathroom. And guess what? She had an abundance of whatever she did that day. Okay? So, anyway. Anyway, okay, so here I am. If there are holes in this teaching, I beg your apology. I beg, I apologize because I had only so much time to prepare. But please keep deepen Bill in your prayers. So last week we learned that conscience is a judgment of reason whereby the human person recognizes the moral quality the goodness or the badness of a concrete act. Conscience enables us to assume responsibility for the act performed. When we have done something evil, then we feel guilty. Who doesn't? Why? Because guilt is the normal result of an evil act. Now let me take you back to Adam and Eve. Remember that their guilt after they disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit? Yeah, they were so guilty that they hid from God and they covered their nakedness. There was the guilty feeling of shame for their being naked. But why was that? 
because they committed an evil act. They went against what God told them. So, uh, formation of conscience. Conscience must be informed and moral judgment enlightened. A well-informed conscience is upright and truthful. It formulates its judgment according to reason. In conformity with a true good will by the wisdom of God. A well-informed conscience is necessary. Why? Because human beings are subjected to negative influences. We get negative influences from people around us or even from our own family and friends. If you have teenage children, you see that, yeah? We have, we have three children and when they, well, let me tell you a story about our younger son, the third child. Our children studied in the Singapore American School. So coming back here and studying at Katie High School was a big adjustment for them. But our younger son could not take it because it was like having two personalities, he said. So we had different sets of rules in our house. And when he went to school to have friends, he had to submit to different rules of his friends. So one day, Rick called me. Ricky doesn't want to go to school. He was graduating from high school and he said, you either transfer me to another school or I won't finish high school. So he said, where do you want to go to school? He wanted to go to school to the Christian Academy, the Faith West now. It used to be Houston Christian Prep School. So when we were there, the admissions director asked him, I want to have an interview with you. If you want your parents there, they are welcome to sit there and listen. But if you don't, they will wait outside. So he said, I want them to be there. And it made me cry. Because when the director of admissions asked him, he said, I cannot handle it anymore because when I go to school, no one wants to be my friends if I did not smoke, if I did not do drugs, if I did not do this after school. And when I go home, I have a different set of rules. I cannot smoke. I cannot do just anything. So it made me cry because he never told me about it. But that's the pressure we are getting from outside, from friends or family even. So, now, because also we are tempted by sin to prefer personal judgment and reject authoritative teaching, we know that the evil one does not rest. He does everything to lure us into sin. While our conscience tells us not to do evil acts, here's the evil one in our ear whispering, Come on, do it. There is time. There is time. You will make it right. There is plenty of time. And we listen to that, right? And we forget what we know is right. We listen to the devil. There is time. There is time to do what? He's telling us that there is time to make it right. But the fact is, we are not sure if there is time. Jesus himself said in scripture, Be always watchful. You do not know when the hour will be. And St. Alphonsus Liguori said, he who promised salvation did not promise tomorrow. So we have to be always watchful. We have 
to live each day like it is our last day on earth. So when that evil one whispers in your ear, go ahead, do it, there is time, there is time, don't listen. So, how is conscience formed? The word of God lights our paths. We must practice what scripture teaches us. So pick up your Bibles and read a little bit each day. But don't stop there. Practice what you read. Practice what scripture teaches. And when an authority teaches you, Saint Alphonsus Ligor, you can tell he's my favorite saint. He said, when you listen with your ear, it doesn't stay. But when you listen with your heart, whatever is taught you stays. So start listening with your hearts. Now, guided by the authoritative teaching of the church, we have the magisterium of the church. The magisterium is the living teaching office of the church whose task is to give us authentic interpretation of the word of God, whether it in its written form, the sacred scriptures, the Bible, or in the form of tradition, the teachings, the preachings of the apostles, now this time the bishops, the pope, the priests. The magisterium ensures the church's fidelity to the teaching of the apostles in matters of faith and morals. So what's the magisterium? The bishops in communion with the Holy Father. The Holy Father, who is also the Bishop of Rome. The priests in the local uh, scene, it's the priests, the deacons, those are the authorities of the church that we need to listen to. Through all of these, we need to pray every day so we can adhere to the truth of our faith and we can avoid erroneous judgment. Again, I cannot emphasize enough the advice of Father Christopher. You have heard him say, pray every day, at least 15 minutes. Prayer keeps us on track. Prayer helps keep us away from evil. Prayer gives us grace. Prayer helps us get the direction of the Holy Spirit. But we need to ask that. It just doesn't come. We need to ask it in prayer. Also, it is important to do an examination of conscience often. Growing up, our mother always taught us that every night at bedtime, we said our night prayer and he taught she taught us to examine make an examination of conscience did you make somebody angry during the day did you have a fight did you have and then whether or not you have committed something wrong do the pray the act of contrition it must be your last prayer before you go to sleep i love this because she said we might not wake up the following morning so cover all bases right so we grew up and then up to now i still say my act of contrition just before i close my eyes to sleep and then we teach that to our children the grandchildren and the the, the great-grandchildren are still too early to learn that. Anyway, so judgment of conscience. A right conscience is well-formed and in alignment with the truth. A good guide is the golden rule. Whatever you wish that men would do to you, 
do so to them. This here is a lesson that needs to be taught early in life. Rick and I find ourselves always saying this to the great grandkids. If you have little kids, they are two years old, and you know how much they fight over one toy. The toy of the other one is always better than hers or his, so they always pop. And we always tell them, if you don't want other kids to snatch your toy away from you, don't snatch other kids' toys. But kids are never too early to learn. So it's a good teaching oh, process to do to your little kids. And, you know, they do not want to be done to them, so they stop doing it. But then again, they forget so how many times a day. In one day, do you have to say it? You have to say it as many times as you can until it takes in their head. So sometimes there can be erroneous judgment due to invisible ignorance. One must follow even an erroneous but certain conscience. Why? Because it may be wrong. He knows that it is wrong, but he thinks he is helping other people. Example, Robin Hood. He stole from the rich and gave to the poor. But bear in mind, the end does not justify the means. It is still a bad act. But judgment is not ours. So, and the other one is visible ignorance. One cannot follow conscience in this state. He makes decisions based on moral or immoral issues without taking time to study the issues. Okay? Another good rule to follow is to practice charity or love. Because love enables us to give respect to people. Charity proceeds from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Sin in its moral gravity. What is sin? Sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It is failure in genuine love for God and neighbor caused by a perverse attachment to certain goods. Sometimes we want something so badly. We want to do even bad things that are not in the book of God, not in our faith's teachings, because we want it so, we commit a sin. Because we want it so badly, never mind. Probably whoever is doing it is listening to the evil one. He doesn't rest. So he's whispering, there is time. Go ahead, do it. You can always go to confession later. But that's not true. So Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1849. Sin is an utterance, a deed, or a desire contrary to eternal law. It is an offense against God. Now we have different kinds of sins. The original sin, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 417. Adam and Eve transmitted to their descendants a human nature wounded by their own first sin, deprived them of original holiness and justice. This deprivation is called original sin. They lost their holiness. Because they committed the sin and it came to us. That is original sin. Now there's personal sin or actual sin that arises from our free and deliberate choice 
word, thought, or desire that turns us from God. Yeah, you hear a lot of people say, the devil made me do it. There's some truth to that. Now, mortal sin is an act which is done with full knowledge of its seriousness with full intent. It is a seriously evil act. It is done with full knowledge. You know it is a sin, and yet you do it. And it has your full consent. You know it is, but you allowed yourself to do it. And then you think, I can always go to confession. And listen to this, you go to confession, and then you come back for the next confession, and you're saying the same sins. It's like a dog coming back to his vomit, right? You threw it out, and yet you picked it up again, like a dog coming back to its vomit. Now, venial sin is a less serious evil sin done intentionally or a seriously evil act done without full knowledge or full consent. Now, know that when you have mortal sin, you need to go to confession. You cannot receive the Eucharist without going to confession if you committed a mortal sin because then you will commit another kind of sin, the sacrilegious sin. But the venial sin, you can pray fervently to God to forgive you and you can still receive Holy Communion. Now sin engenders vice by repetition of the same act. This results in perverse inclinations which cloud conscience and corrupt the concrete judgment of good and evil. It always goes back to Father Ricardo made a good thing in his homily. He said something about you keep committing the same sin. You know it is wrong and yet you keep doing it because there is time, right? And then you realize later on because you keep doing it you actually believe that it is no longer a sin because it keeps coming it keeps coming you keep doing the same sin and you make yourself believe that you're doing it so much that it's not a sin so it's now sin the root of all sins lies in man's heart. To commit a mortal sin is gravely contrary to the divine law. Mortal sin destroys in us the love and the charity without which eternal beatitude is impossible. You know, beatitude? Seeing God face to face. Now, so if you die and you are in the state of mortal sin, you know that cannot happen. So unrepented, mortal sins bring eternal death. Therefore, it is a great necessity to always be in prayer, asking for grace and guidance that we will one day attain eternal beatitude, meeting God face to face. After all, that is the purpose of our journey here on earth. Our life here is in preparation for a life, a happy life of eternal happiness with the Holy Trinity. It's like we're here, we're working for our visas to go to heaven. You cannot go to a country without your visa, right? So you cannot go to heaven without your visa. And what would that be? Staying sinless or, you know, just doing everything that you can while here. I'm reading the sermons of St. Alphonsus and he says, 
I've read that probably more than 10 times since I bought it many years ago. And he said, some saints have gone to the Lord and then come back to tell the people that they know what life is like, what they have seen in hell. Like St. Faustina was shown hell. So he said that the people in hell, their biggest regret is that they cannot see Jesus, they cannot see God, but that also they wish that they had made that little sacrifice while they were here. And then they wouldn't be in hell. But it's too late. When you are gone, then that's it. So, conversion of hearts is very important. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32. God's love is steadfast and that God always extends mercy to us. However, we need to repent. We need to admit our wrongdoing. And we need to turn to our loving Lord to accept His love. And how do we do this? There's the sacrament of reconciliation. This is our faith book says, and I quote, a helpful way to image Christian morality is to see it as saying yes to God's love, letting it shine on us, and then living a life of light and love that shines out to others. I always say, we do not have to open our mouths to evangelize or to teach people. I don't know if I have told you this. When we lived in the Middle East, we belonged to an ecumenical Bible study. And this man, he was a Baptist, and he was a teacher at the uh, international school. And he was telling us about the youth conference that happened in Africa, and he was there. And the people, the priest who was there asked Maria, you are very quiet. Everybody is telling the group how they were spreading the Catholic faith, how they were spreading the love of God. And Maria was quiet. So when she was asked, she said, we do not have money to pay for TV ads. We do not have money to pay for radio ads. We do not have money to have flyers put everywhere. But our church sends out the good families of the parish to the remote areas. And when they see these families who are good, they come to church, they want to be like them, they like what they see. So just be yourself. Just be yourself. Be the best that you can be. You do not have to open your mouth. You do not have to say a word. Have you ever experienced seeing somebody and then your spirits are light and you like what you see in that person, you want to be her friend? Have you ever experienced that? Lastly, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, chapter 13, verse 1. St. Paul says, If I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or clashing symbol. End quote. So reflect on this passage, maybe tonight. This is your assignment. Reflect on this passage. Prayerfully examine your conscience. And maybe you can make a plan on how to respond to God's command of love.
That's it. Thank you. So we, we will have plenty of time for discussion. I think Deacon Bill has written 13 questions. So while you are at discussion, I would advise you to speak what is in your mind. This is the way you learn. You learn faster and better if you say and you listen with your heart to what others say. And don't be shy. Oh, John Paul said, don't be afraid. Say what is in your mind. That's the only way to learn. And listen with your heart. Pick up what the others are saying. I encourage you to join the discussion. Okay? Thank you.